My name is Michael Caldwell, and I am a second year full-time MBA student and president of the Investment Finance Association here at UCLA Anderson. It's with great pleasure that I welcome you all here today for UCLA Anderson's Robertson Lecture Series on Global Business Leadership. It's truly a great honor to introduce our very distinguished guest, Mr. George Roberts, founding partner of the leading global investment firm, Kohlberg, Kravis, Robertson Company, KKR. Mr. Roberts will join Dean Judy Olin for discussion on lessons from four decades of investing and providing market-oriented solutions to social issues. He will share his lessons from four decades of investing and discuss his thoughts on venture philanthropy and how he uses the principles he developed while leading KKR to provide market-oriented solutions to social issues. In addition, he will discuss the REDF model that he pioneered, which works at the intersection between market forces and social impact in an effort to end chronic joblessness in America. Today's lecture series, managed by the Center for Global Management, has been made possible by Mr. Chip Robertson, member of the fully employed class, MBA class of 2006, and his family. The Robertson Lecture Series on Global Business Leadership serves to provide more opportunities for UCLA Anderson MBA students to acquire global leadership perspectives. The Robertson family has dedicated this series to Mr. Leo M. Harvey, a pioneer industrialist and inventor, founder of Harvey Aluminum, and great-grandfather of Chip Robertson. Moderating today's discussion is Judy Olian, Dean of UCLA Anderson and the John E. Anderson Chair in Management. Since assuming her role as Dean in 2006, Dean Olian has strengthened UCLA Anderson's focus on international business and global management, developed targeted partnerships with an emphasis on Asia and Latin America, and advanced UCLA Anderson into one of the leading schools of management in the world. Under Dean Olian's leadership, the Center for Global Management was established. And on behalf of the Center for Global Management and the Investment Finance Association, I would like to thank the co-sponsors of today's Robertson Lecture Series, the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and UCLA Anderson's Net Impact. Now I am privileged to welcome Mr. Roberts to UCLA Anderson. Having co-founded KKR in 1976, Mr. Roberts has more than four decades of experience financing, analyzing, and investing in public and private companies as well as serving on the boards of a number of KKR portfolio companies. Today, KKR is a leading global investment firm that manages investments across multiple asset classes, including private equity, energy, infrastructure, real estate, credit, and hedge funds. In 1997, using the principles he developed while leading KKR, Mr. Roberts co-founded and structured REDF, the Roberts Enterprise Development Fund which is a California-based nonprofit that was formed with a mandate to launch and grow social enterprises. Knowing the power jobs can have in transforming lives and communities, Mr. Roberts put his own money to work to end persistent joblessness and launch what would become known as venture philanthropy with the mindset of an investor and an expected return measured in people with jobs and lives changed. By 2004, REDS methods and reputation had grown, enabling it to convert from a family foundation to the independent nonprofit it is today. Today, Mr. Roberts serves as co-chairman and co-chief executive officer of KKR and is actively involved in managing the firm, serving on each of the regional private equity and portfolio management committees. He earned his BA from Claremont McKenna College and a JD from the University of California Hastings Law School. Would you all please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our moderator, Dean Judy Olian, and our very distinguished and highly accomplished guest, Mr. George Roberts. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, I don't know if I have a lot of questions left after that. <laughs> Great introduction. And, and to Chip, uh, Chip Robertson, thank you so much for spawning and connecting and, and making this event possible. And it's great to see such a terrific mix of people here, both uh, board members, students, friends. And of course, it's because of uh, George Roberts' uh, distinguished uh, record. And I want to also welcome his wife, Lene. There you are. Um, who herself has a distinguished career in, in finance. So this is a, a powerhouse couple that we have here. So I'm going to just start with a very basic and simple question. Um, and I, I should mention, those of you who come from Northern California, thank you for bringing the rain. We don't know <laughs> what that really means in Southern California, but it's, it's great. I'll start from a basic uh, question. Uh, you founded the firm with your partner and first cousin, um, uh, Henry Kravitz and, and Mr. Kohlberg, in, seven, in 1976, 
which was a big new idea at the time, if not the first um, leveraged buyout firm as it was known at the time, certainly one of the first. So what was the big new idea? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and I'm happy we could bring the rain from Northern California down here because we need it up north you know, as, as much as you do down here. Like, I mean, it's the quote, new big idea is usually what it always is, and that's a movement and development from an old idea. So what we basically did, and, and by the way, before we started KKR, this is what I did working with Jerry f for 10 years prior to that. And I actually worked when I was in law school uh, with Jerry doing buyouts. We didn't call them that. We called them lockups because you locked up your capital and you didn't know where you were ever going to get it out or not, but we called them lockups. And the idea was really simple, like most good ideas or enduring ideas, and that was you make an investment in a company and you let management own part of that business where they didn't own it before, and all of a sudden the business did better. And it really wasn't any more complicated than that, and if you think about what corporate America was like in the mid-60s and the 70s when we got started, there were a huge conglomeration movement in the United States at that point in time, um, and we were very, very lucky to buy some divisions of some bigger companies where management could then become owners, and they ran their business better. Uh, and, you know, we were able to convince some institutions to loan us some money to do it. Uh, banks weren't even doing it then. It was mainly the insurance companies that were willing to make the loans, and they worked. Some, not all of them did, but they did work, and the companies improved, and we were able to create value for doing that. So in 1976, we decided, well, let's tr give it a go on our own, because we've been doing this for 10 years. We thought maybe, it, maybe we could make something work, and we started KKR with $120,000 capital to really go do this. So over the last four decades, not just at KKR, but at the in the industry itself, What's changed? Has your philosophy of investing changed? Well, lots changed. You know, we started out, we didn't have any money and we didn't have any deals. <laughs> <laughs> and today you have, uh, it, it, at least it, it just in private equity, not, not uh, hedge funds or in other uh, alternative classes, but just in private equity, you have $2 trillion around the world committed to this asset class. You have 6,500 firms, 500 of which are in China, designed to do what we do. So we've gone from very little here to an awful lot here, and what all that means is that returns get compressed and, and you start to have some reversion back to the means, and it's really the better firms that will outperform that. So everything's changed, the whole world's changed. I mean, uh, just look at the flags up on the wall here and how globalized, um, you know, Anderson's become. Just think how about globalized the world's become. And fast forward that a little bit more and where it's gonna go in 20 years. So today you need far more skills than what we had in 1976. You, you need to be able to not only do the analysis right, but you really need to be able to figure a way before you make an investment how are you going to create value? How do you see the creation of value? And how are you going to go do it And if vis-a-vis -vis your competitors? And if you don't see that, then what you're going to wind up doing is paying the highest price and getting the lowest return for those assets. So the skills we have today, we have 60 people in an operations group. We have a capital markets business. Uh, we, we have an, uh, industry verticals in terms of teams. We have eight different industries that people work in throughout the world. Uh, we're coordinated all over the world. We have 17 offices uh, around the world today, almost 1,200, almost 1,200 people, and really um, multiple pools of capital that all work together in terms of trying to find opportunities around the world, and that's that's really how we're organized. So, you know, it's changed an awful lot, and it will continue to change. Uh, it's very competitive, and that's just the way it goes. 
if, if you were to think about some of the deals that you've made, I mean, th there's one that gets more publicity than, than all others, and that's the RGR Nabisco deal. But when you think about a deal that you've made that represents the best of private equity creation of value, and maybe a deal that you think of that you shouldn't have made. Well, there are a lot of the latter, you know. <laughs> and quite frankly, you don't learn anything from your successes. You learn more from your failures. And, uh, and we've aired our share of those. And what we try to do is go back every year and, and re-engineer what we did wrong and what we're going to learn from it and so we don't make that mistakes in the future. So the ones that haven't worked out well have had uh, probably three characteristics in it. One, we had the wrong management. Secondly, we replaced that management with the wrong management again. <laughs> and, um, secondly, we missed, uh, I would call, some, some trends that uh, we should have known. For example, um, we owned uh, Spalding's, a sporting goods company. And we really missed the trend to the amalgamation of power that the retailers then had. Because uh, Titleist golf balls, which were a very high margin business, and sold, only sold in green grass pro shops and with good margins, now became flanker products in the Walmarts and the Kmarts and the Dick's Sporting Goods and the prices went down and margins went down and you had more competition. You know. Um, Probably the biggest miss we've had is, was Energy Future Holdings, which was utility we bought, um, and uh, unregular utility we bought in Texas. And uh, we totally missed the fact that natural gas prices were gonna go from eight to two. Although we had hedged for the first seven years, prices around seven, we thought we had a pretty safe deal. So what I would say is get the management right, and then just make sure that you don't get on the wrong side of macro trends that take place that disrupt uh, industries. Some of which are unpredictable. Yeah. Um, now, can I talk about one good one? Okay, yeah. go. Uh, <laughs> uh, very quickly, uh, back in the mid-80s, we bought a company called Safeway, uh, a grocery store business. They have bonds down here. Uh, and what we saw in that were three businesses. One very good, where they had labor parity and market shares, and secondly, uh, you know, okay market shares, but labor parity, and third, where they had neither market shares or labor parity. So very simply, we got out of the third tier, took the capital, invested it in the second and first tier, changed the uh, consumer-facing uh, activities in the company, uh, the business grew, and we did very, very nicely. And I know everybody these days talks about leverage, but that was a $6 billion deal in 1986, and we only put up $130 million of equity. So roughly two and a half times purchase price today. So when we sold it, uh, we created about $7 billion for our investors and you know, $130 million investment. So I like to talk about that when we you know, talk <laughs> about the value. I, I, I mean, one of the things that, that you say, and, and that's an interesting case study because that's typically known as a very low margin business and yet you turned right. it around. Um, y you talk about investing in people as a, as a primary right. f factor. I know somebody else in this room who talks about investing in the jockey always. Is that the primary factor that differentiates a great deal from one that's just well, a good deal? You know, even the greatest jockey in the world needs a good horse. So um, I think you need both. Um, and, but people really do matter, um, you know, in, in, in a huge way. Um, we, we bought a company in Los Angeles back in the first deal we did, actually, in 1976. And they were in every cyclical business you could be in. They were in defense, they were in automotive, and they were in housing. And the CEO at the time, Ray O'Keefe, and then we went through a terrible recession in 1980 and 81, and he had a little sign on his desk which basically said, you know, when the wind don't blow, rope. And we got through that very nicely, whereas other companies didn't. Um, another good example is First Data, where 
we did whiff twice on the wrong management. We finally got the right one in there, and, and Frank is making just a huge difference. So I think if, it's, if you have an okay business or a good business, and you have a great management, you'll have a really good, good business. Keep but, in mind. By the way, um, in probably about 20 minutes, I'll turn to you for, for questions. There are microphones here. So please save up all the good questions um, to ask uh, Mr. Roberts. So there are quite a number of Anderson MBA students here. Please raise your hands. OK. And keep your hands up if you kind of would lust to enter the private equity world. Keep your hands up. OK. Quite a few. Uh, how do you? get into, as a newly minted MBA, um, the private equity industry? And what, what makes, what dispositional characteristics uh, enable somebody to thrive in, in your world? Well, you know, uh, I can only speak for KKR. I can't speak for other firms. That, you know, they have, everybody's got their own culture and values on how they, how they do deal with it. But, you know, I think for us, um, um, we have what we call the, 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 the no-jerk policy. So the first thing we do when we interview people is we uh, take them out to dinner and we see the way they treat the cab driver if they're in New York or the bus boy or the waiter or the people that they're interacting to. I've, I have a strong belief that you can tell a lot about somebody by the way they treat somebody that they don't really have to be nice to and maybe somebody that they'll never see again. So that's the first test. You've got to be a, de a, decent, a decent human being, really. The other, I mean, if, if you've gone to a school like Anderson and you've obviously worked and done something else, you know, we assume you have the smarts uh, and that you can learn what we do. What we do is not, is really not all that hard when it, when it comes down to it. And so it's really the, the kind of person you are, the, are you a self-starter? Uh, are you someone that uh, wants to sit at the head of the table and take leadership roles? Are you the kind of person that others are going to gravitate to over a period of time and will look to you for advice and, and for help? Uh, are you willing to put yourself at risk and come up with ideas and thoughts that maybe not be so popular but could be some, some ways to be innovative and different to what we do? Um, are you the kind of person that really throws themselves into everything that you do? Are you the kind of person that has other interests besides finance and work? It's really looking at the whole person as opposed to what the immediate skills that a younger person will have today to bring to the, to the party. And, and do you, you know, one of the challenges for starting MBA students is that the private equity world doesn't necessarily hire right out of MBA programs. Does KKR? Yeah, you do. And look, look, I think that... Please don't come with resumes yeah. at the end. But one, of the, one of the more successful people we have at our firm, we hired because um, uh, what he wanted to be was a concert pianist, and he didn't quite, wasn't quite able to achieve that. But I remember when Henry and I interviewed him, we said, you know, anybody that's going to put the effort in, um, you know, to try to accomplish something at that level, will put the effort in to accomplish other, other things. Um, I think a, a route into uh, firms like ours and others is maybe uh, getting an internship job at some point, obviously, in the career. Uh, if those avenues aren't open, then what I would suggest you do is to um, get, a, get a job either with a really good uh, consulting firm that does hands-on work, someone like an Alex Partners, um, and um, you, you know you know the names of them, Bain, McKinsey, etc. Where you can develop um, operational skills, you know, where you've actually been involved in a company or go to work for a company in, in some specific area, where you can then bring those skills to firms like ourselves and others, where we don't have a lot of people that have those skills that have come out of business or come out of in industry and sort of chart a path, you know, to be able to get yourself in a position to do that. The advantage of working at a, a Bain or McKinsey or J. Alex, you will probably interface a lot with a lot of private equity firms and build those relationships as you do it. And secondly, uh, you know, you all are task-oriented, 
So set a program out that if this is what you want to do, that you're going to go do it. So build the relationships with people in these firms and come up with a game plan about how you're going to attack this and what you're going to go do. And you'll find uh, just picking up the phone sometime and calling somebody um, will bear fruit to you. I get a lot of calls like that. I always take them. Uh, people I don't know, uh, people that maybe have an idea, because, you know, at some point in my career, people have taken my phone call where I've asked for a favor or asked for something. So don't be afraid to do that. And attack it and go after it just like you would any other project that you would do. So you've had a 40-year partnership with Henry Kravitz. You're co-everything. You're co-chairman. You're co-CEO. How... And um, I don't need to tell you that a lot of partnerships in life and in marriage don't last that long. Um, h how has it worked as well as it has? Well, he, Henry and I are first cousins. You know, our parents told us we met when we were two, although I don't remember that. Uh, neither, <laughs> neither, neither, neither is Henry. But, so our families were close growing up. I, I was told, or well, somebody mentioned something about a bike that you both we're competing over and... Well, that was the last argument we had. I think we were... Uh, oh, I see. Uh, I think we were eight or nine, and, uh, you know, Henry had a new bike, and I wanted to ride his bike, and uh, we got in a tussle, and he ran into the garage door and split his head open, and that was the last time we ever fought about anything. But, uh, look, I think that uh, it's like anything in life. I mean, we went to school together. We were... Had, we were roommates in New York when we had summertime jobs uh, back there. Uh, at least in my experience, um, relationships have to be built, built on total respect and total trust. And, and you have to believe that that person has your back. And, you know, we all both have egos. Everybody has one. And that you've got to sort of park it uh, aside when it comes to those relationships. And, then you have to realize, like in anything, that the relationship that you have with someone is far more important than any of the other stuff that goes along with it. And, you know, all that stuff really doesn't matter. What matters is, is preserving that. And that doesn't mean you can't disagree. We, we disagree. Uh, we all have different ways of doing things, different lifestyles, etc. But the fundamental DNA of, of trust and respect and looking out for each other is something that's it's pretty precious, and it's probably it's very much worth uh, preserving. Do you have a division of labor? No. You do both do everything, bring deals, decide on deals. Yeah, together. Much. Yeah, and our responsibilities at KKR are, are, are together. We don't split that. Interesting. Um, and and, and I, I'm just wearing my leadership yeah. hat here. Does everyone know that they can go to either of you and? can't play each other against the other and go to you for both, for both sets of issues, for all issues? Uh, well, nobody tries to play us against each other. And, and I, I think maybe you've been a, you know, in the past few people have tried, but they're not there anymore. <laughs> so, 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 no, I think we speak with one, pretty much one, one, voice. one voice. And that, you know, that's important in any organization, you know, have a consistent, consistent message. And look, I think, you know, leaders need to do a couple of things. One, you have to have a vision. And secondly, you have to have moral courage. And thirdly, you have to have people that you want to follow you believe that you care more about their success than you do on your own. And I think if you get those three things right, um, you know, you're, you've done a good job. And that's what we try to do. So going back to a couple of business issues, we just had our board meeting over the weekend, and we spoke a little bit about activist investors. I'd love to hear your take on whether that's a force of good or evil or somewhere in between. Well, they're great for us. I mean, so, um, you know, they, they, they create value, you know, create opportunities for us. Look, activist investors, I mean, that's the, you know, that's the third deriv derivative to the folks that, when I got started, were the green mailers. You know, Carl Icahn's done a very nice job of morphing into where he is today versus where, where he is. Having said that, 
and taking personalities out of it. Good activism, I think, is healthy for any kind of a market-based uh, economy. Because there are companies that um, can use some help, can use some shaking up. Um, I think the fact that an activist bought less than 1% of Microsoft and created some tension in the boardroom and some change it was a very good thing. And the stockholders have rewarded the company. The stock's doubled since that's taken place. There's some fundamental things, I think, in every, every company that probably could be done a little bit better. But the playbook of borrow a lot of money, leverage yourself up, and spin off your divisions, I'm not sure is the right, the right way to do it. So, as a whole, I would say that it's, it's good, for, good for corporations. Uh, it, it's good to have people out there that are willing to express different views. At the end of the day, the shareholders are going to determine you know, what's right and what's wrong, and you know, that's, that's what we want. Uh, the Europeans, by the way, especially in the UK, have, a, have a, had a far more active group of shareholders than we ever have, have here, too. So. And unions. That are that voice too, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, we often talk about where the world is headed. Uh, certainly, artificial intelligence, fintech, ad tech. You had an episode at KKR in September where a market maker opened the day, and I don't know if you know why he opened it at half of yesterday's. Yeah stock value and of course there was quite a bit of turmoil and I'm sure that that person isn't there anymore right. or I'm assuming that. Right. Um, do, do you believe that these kinds of trading trends are going to push us towards more computerized modeling away from the human interaction and more oh, towards AI? Yeah, I don't think there's anything doubt, doubt about it. Uh, I wish, first of all, I wish the guy would have called us when he'd opened the stock at 10 bucks. You would have bought He could yeah. have found some buyers. But yeah. <laughs> uh, look, I mean, look how complicated the world is today. Everything is so interconnected. Um, you know, nothing happens anywhere where it's not instantly known in the rest of the world. So to expect volatility not to increase over time, I, I think we're just kidding ourselves. And you know, you saw the news in the paper today about China's exports being down. Um, that has a major effect on lots of different things in the world that uh, you probably 10, 15 years ago, if that would have been the case, you probably never found out about it. So you know, it, it's going to continue to be volatile. In fact, there, there's so much off, off market, uh, dark pools and all these other trading that take place that what you see in the paper in terms, or the, on your screen in terms of the amount of volume is probably sometimes third or half of what really is taking place. And, and so, you think that FinTech would be able to accommodate that better? I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, um, you know, there's um, humans in a way are machines, right, when we do it. And hopefully we can build uh, better machines to make the trading and connections a lot faster. Humans are also subject to biases and incomplete processing. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned China, and your chief research person or came out with a report after touring um, China just recently. is is pretty bearish, not just in terms of China's issues, but in, in, in the global impact. How are you translating that into the decisions you're making? Okay. Well, we, you know, we have quite a... a, a, a big practice in China, in Beijing. We have 20, 26 professionals there. And our thesis has been, since we've been there for 10 years now, is really to invest in uh, growth of a consumptive economy and stay away from export-oriented businesses and the state-owned enterprises. So we've invested in food, clean water, dairy, uh, uh, leasing companies, et cetera that are pretty much there, local. That's there and with good partners. <clears throat> and so I think what, the, what Henry McVeigh was talking about and what you saw in the paper today of Chinese exports going down is really bad news for uh, the world economy. And what that really means is that because of technology and everything else, we're producing so much more than the world wants to consume. We're producing too much stuff. 
like what technology has done to the energy industry in terms of the amount that can be produced there. So China today has, has a higher labor cost than Mexico. And then they're competing with Africa and the rest of the world that are doing to them what China did to the United States in terms of our manufacturing businesses. So in a global economy where everybody's competing and you're producing so many things, and by the way, the free enterprise system has had a lot to do with freeing up economies to produce more to, to provide for their people. You're going to have a situation where supply is far greater than, than demand. And the emerging markets are going to get hurt even more because of that, uh, because they depend on China. Uh, and the U.S., I think, with for companies that um, are not dependent upon that, that have real domestic growth, those companies are going to get valued higher over time than, than they would because of this, because money's going to come out of here and move into that, that area. But this isn't a good sign. And, and do you see that impacting your particular investments internal to China? Because, of course, they're impacted by exports well, internally. I, yeah, you know, I think so, but probably to a lesser extent than than you know um, than some of the other industries there. Uh, they still now the manufacturing's gone down and their exports going down, but the service economy growth is going up. That's growing about eight or nine percent a year, and that's really what the Chinese government wants to do. Is they don't want this to go down, but they want to create um, a consumptive economy. The savings rates in China are forty percent, right. so um, they need to do something to get their their population to spend. So with that as backdrop in terms of global impact, and you live in Northern California, and some people are talking about a rather frothy economy up there, do you expect this year, um, and last year was a great year for private equity exits. Do you expect this year to be as good? Do you see any future clouds on the horizons? Well, look, I think, um, I think for private equity, I think 2015 will be a good year for exit for people. I mean, everybody in our business, having come out of the, the, the bad times, the financial crisis, have been doing everything they can to provide, get capital back to people. And I think that'll continue, continue for a while. Um, and it'll get to the point where now all these big funds that were <laughs> very much out, unallocated to private equity are going to be over-allocated, and that's when they'll go pu push a lot of money back in the system at the wrong time, and we'll have some, some more excesses again. Okay. That didn't sound so good in terms of your prediction. Uh, no, 15 will be okay. And 16? We're 16 will be, look, I think what we're, what, you know, we've had a nine, year, uh, nine years almost right. in the growth in, some, in the economy. And then obviously from a lower base, at some point in time we'll have a have a slowdown, and uh, maybe it's 17, 18. I don't know, but you know nothing nothing keeps going like this for. So I want to switch now to your um, um, very very significant intellectual and emotional commitment to bringing um, market forces to social impact. How did you get there? Uh, I mean, I can quote from this great Wall Street. Journal um, editorial that you wrote, where you wrote about um, urging your corporate colleagues to partner with social enterprises through their supply chains and hiring practices to make them and the people they employ as successful as possible. So, how did you get to that thinking? How do, how do you use your business acumen to make, uh, frankly, uh, the world, the communities in which you live, better through Rediff? Well, I think it started with the philosophy that, you know, with what what money I did have to give away, I wanted to do something that if I didn't do it, wouldn't get done. That's really how it all got started. And the idea really came about of watching people that were homeless in San Francisco, where I live. And we tried a number of different things that all failed until I ran across a guy named Jed Emerson who... Uh, basically uh, was a social worker and he, he was burned out. He ran an organization called Larkin Street. And I said, why don't you do a study for me about what I could do in the Bay Area? And he came across this idea of there are a number of social enterprises in the Bay Area, Ashbury Industries, which 
made t-shirts, another company that repaired bicycles, and they were all hiring uh, folks that, that uh, had major issues in their life. They'd call it the bottom 1% of the population in the United States. And I said, you know, I don't know how to do much, but I do know that if you put, take some capital and you put some smart people behind it, you can help businesses grow. So why not? And that's what we did. We got started basically taking some capital and getting some people, Jed and others, that would work with these companies. And if they could grow their business, they could create more opportunities to hire more people that fit here. And that's really, that was the genesis of it. And so now it's morphed into really a multiplier model where you try and take right. organizations that then train people to get them back into the world. What's the focus of the populations that? Well, it's, you know, it's uh, bottom 1%, at least our statistics, and there's, there's been 10,000 people that have gone through um, the different groups that we've helped, uh, five of which are in Los Angeles. Um, and California seems to be a forefront of, of social enterprises. Uh, you know, of the 10,000, almost 70% have been incarcerated at some point in time in their life. Um, the female population have usually come from abuse, um, abuse situations at home. Uh, maybe 50% have a high school education, if, if, if that. Um, folks that you know, basically have been uh, passed by and that are living on substance, you know, the substance level. And so your focus is, is very heavily on those who can't necessarily get jobs. They've had, um, their their uh, out of prison populations predominantly. And then you fund the organizations that create opportunities for them. Landscape organizations, construction, right waste management, all kinds, right. but they're employing these populations. Right. So, so that's a huge multiplier model. How do you also make, uh, encourage others like you who have been very successful and very privileged and fortunate in their successes to view this as part of their obligation, their moral obligation, their civic obligation um, to, to make their communities better? Well, look, I think, um, I think all of you, and especially the younger people in this room, um, you know, are far more interested in, in um, giving their time and effort as part of their business life uh, to helping others, whether it doesn't matter what it is. Far more, than, quite frankly, than my generation when I got out of school. So I applaud all of you for, for that. And, you know, what we're trying to do at Red F is really um, roll this out on a more of a national scale. Uh, we just got a, um, a social innovation grant from the federal government, our second one, which was really to identify throughout the country um, other organizations that we might be able to help and provide capital, uh, uh, human and financial capital to. Um, and we had over 350, I think, qualified applications for that. So we're going to pick 25 and four different cities, and we're going to try to build this, build this out. Uh, we have an intern program at, at Red F. We're, I think, I think in the past we've hired some folks from um, Anderson to come work for the summer for us, and they're usually giving jobs about working in one of the enterprises in terms of helping them, helping them grow. Um, I, you know, I hope, and I'm sure you all are doing this, I hope when you get out of school or even when you're in school, that you get involved somehow in some nonprofit that does something. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to add a lot, especially with your skills and education. You'll, you'll get a lot out of it. And to make that part of your, part of your life in terms of what you're going to go do in the, in the future. So let's now turn to you to ask questions. Uh, please go to the microphone and introduce yourself. There's a microphone right here and introduce yourself. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a relationship to some company or they're uh, bound to a uh, government like, like the, for private equity, private equity. So is, is the question the core competency of yeah, the yeah, private yeah. equity firm relationships with other private equity firms or with? Uh, uh, what, uh, what, what you think is uh, just for this time period because it's a new thing in China uh -huh. and or what is a trend? 
Uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Is the, is the private equity trend in China something that's going to grow? Because it's, it's new. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sure. Look, I think that the way it's going to grow is, is not necessarily by buying control of a Chinese company. I, you know, um, that's certainly not something that we'd be interested in doing. But what we are interested in doing is investing in Chinese companies where we can help them. For example, we invested in Hire, which I'm sure you know is a big retail company. And uh, <clears throat> they wanted our capital, but they really wanted us to help them expand uh, uh, internationally, which we've done. And we have joint ventures now with them with some companies we have that have products in Germany. Uh, we've been able to bring some operational skills to helping them uh, improve their businesses. So for us in China, and I can't speak for others, it's more investing with good Chinese partners and, and business people uh, and helping them grow and internationalize, in many cases, their companies. So uh, I don't think we'd ever do 100% leverage buyout in China. And I think the question, and you answered it, in the other direction, I think the question was also for Chinese private equity firms, what's their best strategy for growth? Uh. Well, I think, um, you know, to date, what most, a lot of the, 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 the smaller uh, company, uh, private equity firms have done is really just be pre-IPO investors. And the stock market went up and they made, made money and the stock market goes down, they lose money. That's not a winning strategy. I think what you need to be able to do is create the skills that are going to allow you to help Chinese companies grow their business. You have to be able to create value. Please, and please introduce yourself. Raquel Brigham Brown, alum, Anderson alum, class of 86. Welcome. And thank you. Nice to meet both of you. And Mr. Roberts, my question, I'm going to say the question and I'll give you a little context. The question really is, you said good management and you said good management, and you said good management. But what does that mean? What does that look like? And this is the context. Back in the 90s, I was working with the CEO of Borden's, and that would have been uh, Bob Kidder, and Doug Smith was in the food business. So I watched KKR a lot. I was there intimately. I think that was a business that ended up having tremendous value to KKR. And so as a leadership advisor, I'm just wanting to hear from your perspective what was good management, uh, and what does that really, you know, what does that look like as someone who was advising the leader, and I'll tell you, they were shaking in their boots every time there was going to be a KKR meeting, and we kept saying to them, you're on the right track, you're on the right track. So, What does good management mean to you? Because you, you keep emphasizing that that's a critical factor in creating value in your leverage buyouts. Well, I think it's both good management and good leadership. Um, you know, it's, it's probably more the leadership part of it than the management side of it. And it's, it goes back to how do you get an organization uh, and a business to work together to get the best results they can? And I remember uh, a book about Peter Drucker I read a long time ago, and he said the best organizations are the ones that allow, create an environment where the people can do their best work. So that means the elimination of, as best as you can, of politics, of all the things that interfere with you and me doing our best, best work every day. So one, somebody that can do, do that. Secondly, um, again, you have to have, uh, whether you're, whatever you're doing, if you're leading a business, you have to have a vision for where that business wants to go. And then you've got to be prepared for yourself to walk the talk. So what I've always said is don't ask other people to do something you either haven't done yourself or you wouldn't do yourself, sort of as a litmus test. And then you've got to be able to attract and you have to be able to keep the best people that you can because you can't do it all on your own. So somebody that has a vision, somebody that can attract other people, and, and uh, you know, someone that's, you know, it's just sort of there all the time, you know, and, and walk in the halls and, and you know, being there for people. Uh, it's no one or two or three or four things. It's just what you do and how you do it every, every day. And then it really comes down to what kind of person you are, which we talked about earlier. I think that, that matters a lot too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And please speak up in the question. 
Good morning. My name is Mohamed Traoré, CMC Class 007. <laughs> um, my question is, um, KKR, just like Abraj and Elios Capital Partners, has been redoubling its efforts in Africa. And um, basically, there's a lot of overhang right now because companies cannot find large enough deals. And uh, should that overhang be redirected towards uh, infrastructure investments in, instead, uh, um, uh, in order to grow the pie? And what are, what are the ways that those governments over there can align better with uh, private equity firms uh, in terms of investment horizons? Okay. Thank well, you. That's a good question. You know, we actually have an investment in a company in Ethiopia called Afroflora, which produces, uh, um, it's the largest producer of roses that go to uh, uh, Europe from, uh, from Africa. Uh, there are over 10,000 people that work there. They're mainly women, and so there's schools and hospitals and everything else that's part of part of this infrastructure. And uh, we've got total cooperation and help from the the government in Ethiopia. The, some of the biggest needs, and we would love to invest more money in in, in certain countries in in Africa. And one of the biggest needs is electricity and power. And you would think that would be simple, but getting the, the permits and all of the things you need to do to buy GE engines and peaker plants and bring them over there and create power and have you know um, uh, counterparties that you can that you can trust on is it takes an awful lot of time, um, you know. And we we're focused on um, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, uh, and Nigeria. Really, is and Ethiopia is the four of the countries that. We would like to invest more money there. I think if you know the, it's really about the kind of government policies that they governments want to put in place, and you'll be able to attract an awful lot of capital to that that part of the world. Thank you. Uh, we have very little time left because of your classes, but maybe if you ask a quick question and we ask Mr. Roberts for a quicker answer. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm Justin. I'm a, actually a PhD student in finance. So my research is in the internal organization of partnerships and the compensation. So just in the context of like private equity, I found that a lot of private equity partnerships, they, uh, they're in terms of compensation. Some uh, like say we give bonus to uh, give incentive pay. Others will say, well, our culture is to try to say create equal profit sharing for all the partners with, within a firm. So I'm just interested in what's your guiding principle in terms of compensation within a partnership, and specific, if it's possible to answer, uh, what would be the kind of the compensation structure within a certain business sector within KKR? Thanks. Sure. Well, that's a good question. Uh, I assume you've been interviewing at some other firms, right? Bio firms, private equity firms. <laughs> yes. You know, what we've tried to do is we operate as one firm, so we have one P and L period. And then people get paid on three different, uh, three different criteria. One, uh, did they live the culture and values of the firm? We actually write those down. People are reviewed on that every year. Secondly, uh, how did they do with leading and managing? Did they, you know, how did, how did they help other people in the firm? And thirdly, the economic um, performance for that person, you know, for that year. The first two are far more important than the latter because it takes five, six, seven years in many cases to actually know how an investment's going to really work. And uh, whether you're in Beijing or London or Menlo Park, whatever it is, you're paid out of that. We don't have silos. And believe me, it's a lot easier to, to manage in silos than it is the way we do it. And we spend a hell of a lot of time trying to figure that out and get the best people that we can and, and pay them accordingly. We have a star system, so um, you know, if you're a real star, you'll, you can make four or five times the amount that somebody else that's doing a nice job and performing vis-a-vis um, -vis, you know, how you've done. Now, most other private equity firms don't do it that way. And uh, many of our publicly traded competitors measure you by how you do in the different groups that that you're in. And we've chosen not to it because we want to make sure that everybody will work with everybody else 
in the firm without as raising their hand and saying, if I do this, what's in it for me? And, and one recognizes that KKR is one of the few, I mean, there have been more, of these private equity firms that are publicly traded. Right. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Ellen Herman, second year MBA student. Thank you for coming. Um, my question was, could you just touch a little on venture philanthropy really quickly and kind of lessons learned both in private equity and through Red F that might apply to the industry? Uh, that's a good question. And that's really what, that's what we really tried to do in venture philanthropy is bring what we've learned in private equity, which is bring some capital and some good people in to help organizations grow their business. And where we've done that right, those organizations have, have been able to grow and, and do things. But, you know, the, the population that you're dealing with uh, in many of these is usually the executive director is very smart, hardworking. They work 16 hours a day. Uh, you know, the, the population that they're leading didn't go to the Anderson School. So they deal with many different HR issues than, than you can imagine. Uh, they're underpaid for the job that they that they they do, and they get burned out. So, you know, there's term ter, you know change over there and everything else that that takes place. But, you know, the real goal is to get things that can can scale. So something can work in Los Angeles, can work in Chicago or different places, and then you can get people like yourselves and others that are willing to devote your life or part of your life to help those organizations really go out and help and help people. And, and one other, I think, clear carryover from the private equity world is a real measurement and results orientation. You actually right. do research around the outcomes of right. what happens through these enablers, through these companies, to the employment outcomes of this 1%. Yeah. And you do very disciplined studies about that. Yeah, we actually try to track it, and we have a outside firm come in and do a study for us every year so we can see how effective or ineffective uh, we are. It's easy to, to track people after they've left for one or two jobs, but after that, it, it sort of falls off. Um, regardless, um, we do know how much it costs to keep people in prison, and we do know how much it costs to keep people on government uh, welfare and, and subsistence. So the private sector, should be able to do a heck of a lot better job than, than what's being done now. Thank you. Last quick question. Hi, uh, I'm Suman. I'm a second year undergraduate. Uh, my question is basically like a lot less technical. Uh, what do you think the most crucial skills undergrads should pick up during their college experiences? Not only um, undergraduates or, you know, or, or, or business school graduates or anybody, the most important thing you'll find in your life is building relationships. And, um, you know, I can't talk about that enough. I mean, and, and I, I watch younger people today, and the way they communicate is texting or social, you know, media, whatever you're doing. Very few people pick up the phone and call other people. Or actually go see them. You're right, or go see them. I think, mm -hmm. you know, people even break up now on texting. <laughs> So, you know, in a way, um, you know, you're, you're losing that human touch. I mean, I don't know when the last time I got a thank you note from a younger person. Those things matter. People remember you if you sit down and you drop them a note or you pick up the phone and you call them. Even among yourselves. I mean, you all are going to be business leaders. You know, you got a lot of, lot of room uh, in, in your careers. Build those relationships with, with one another and try to build relationships with other people that, that are out there and keep in touch with those. That's going to take you much farther than any course you could ever learn in school or whatever you're going to go do. It's, you know, it's the essence of life, really, is having personal relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Roberts. Thank you, George, for <laughs>